my friends. This is Dr. Mohammed Nizami again uh, with another lecture on um, microwave and RF uh, circuit and devices design and 3D simulations. Um, we continue um, uh, this series today. We are going to be uh, doing one more video on radial com power combiners and splitters. We did cover several of these. I think this is the fifth uh, in this series, in this uh, playlist. I urge you to um, to go ahead and, and click below and see the list of uh, videos that are available for this playlist, radial combiners, and for the other stuff that we've talked about. So uh, just to remind you, I am uh, an, an independent um, out of circuit designer. Um, I do designs um, uh, and work with you remotely. I turn in boards for um, from specifications to uh, all the way to your Gerber files available at your desk, including bill of material, uh, board design, um, modeling simulations, um, whatever it is, we can do it. Uh, so if you have any need for an RF designer to do remote work, um, that is very inexpensive compared to the United States. I operate at, at uh, much, much lower rate than uh, you can find in uh, from uh, by hiring uh, consultants in the United States or Europe. Uh, I'm available, so go ahead and uh, reach me, reach out to me with this email here or this phone here. Okay, and I could be contacted with these apps here, WhatsApp and Telegram as well. Okay, so uh, just a little uh, another announcement. I have a three D uh, out of a microwave device designing three D HFSS modeling, which is primarily built with the uh, videos that you see in my. Uh, playlist, not just the radio combiners, but the other stuff. Um, it's hands-on, so you come in with your laptop and your evaluation uh, copy of HFSS, and we start you out from zero. Or if you're uh, if you're knowledgeable, we can uh, also you can uh, um, enjoy it, and and uh, we go through these designs that we have here and build them from scratch, uh, plus the theory of operation as well for these devices. We, we do an entire course on microwave and RF devices, okay? Primarily uh, anything that is used in the transmit and receive path of face array antennas, radars, um, satcoms, be it whatever, or, or uh, 5G uh, transceivers. So the, the next, our first tra uh, training session will be held in February 15th to 18th at the uh, Olive Branch Hotel in Jordan, okay, Jiraj Jordan, and it's uh, the uh, fee is $1,000 per person, and we pay for the hotel room and the meals for the three days, plus there'll be some activities as well outside the uh, duration of the uh, training where we have set up some um, visits to see uh, attractions around the city here. Okay, so be sure to uh, contact me at this email so that I can get you registered for that. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and, and finish up uh, one more session in the radial power combiners. And we said in the last sessions, we showed why do we need to do things radial combiners? What, what's the, the key features of these, as opposed to the conventional Watkinson corporate uh, structure um, splitters and, and, and um, combiners? Why are we using these? These are mechanical devices, the involve 3D um, while the other stuff is just a X Y Z X Y plane where we do um, things in macro strip and, and no need for CNCing or uh, do malware work. Uh, we did cover. We said that 
um, we have several classes of radial uh, power dividers, and we uh, we showed uh, so all these. Are you can see this is the fifth session, and today we're gonna go through one of these, which is conical transmission line uh, or cavity transmission line ring cavity uh, combiner splitter. So let's just show. Well, before that, let's just, where do we use these? Just to remind you, just to refresh your minds on this. We, these radial combiners are mainly used for um, either feeding antennas, okay, antenna feed, or using power amplifiers, okay? In power amplifiers, we can conventionally, as you know, we have, get a signal and we split it in ways to end amplifiers, and we have n way combiners to get to a common line. Now, if you look at this, as I will show in a minute, as you start uh, splitting more and more, say beyond eight, no, not even eight, beyond, I would say uh, four, uh, um, or beyond, no, I would say 16, sorry, I, I meant uh, the other way around. Uh, you're starting to, it starts to get to a real, um, hectic job of, of maintaining the splitting and combining, especially you're going to get a lot of mismatches between all these ports. There is really very little that you can do to get symmetry, symmetry between the, the branches in here. Okay. So that's one thing. Plus the, look at the accumulation of losses where every time you split and combine, there is loss associated with it. So there's a, layers and layers of, 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 of accumulated um, losses, where if you can do things in radial um, uh, combining and splitting, uh, in there you, you can see that you're really not, you don't have, it's all done at once. So it's, it's immediate um, splitting and immediate combining, okay? So, so the other thing why we use radial combiners is look at this. If, if you look at the, the uh, corporate um, uh, devices used to split and combine signals, uh, high frequency signals, you're always going to rely on either Watkinson or the uh, hybrid, 90 degree hybrid, or the uh, rat race um, device. And all of these, as you can see, are based on quarter wavelength suctions because we use a quarter wave transformer to match the different impedances, okay? And as you know, uh, quarter wave transformers are narrow banded relatively. So to get to broaden these, you would need to go higher order. And if you go higher order, uh, it becomes very difficult to go beyond four um, stages of, of multi-stages of of, of quarter wavelength um, sections. And I'll show you in a minute why. And basically you can see it in the figure here that uh, when you design a Watkinson divider or combiner, the computation of the line impedances start from right at the load and then continue toward the generator. And as you can see, we get narrower and narrower quarter wave sections and that's, Physically, uh, eventually, you will get to a point where beyond four, the line will be so tiny that you can't maintain um, uh, tolerable uh, fabrication, okay? Plus, you're gonna get losses, excessive losses. So, so as you can see here, if, you, if you're trying to um, come up with, say, um, um, uh, let's say you're trying to feed uh, 32 antenna elements, it becomes very difficult to maintain that using um, a corporate uh, method like this. And just to show you that, let's just go before we go that. I know we did go through this spreadsheet last time. Let's say that uh, we have a transformer um, like this, a two-way combiner. And if you go and say uh, the first order one, your impedance will be the well-known impedance, which is the square root of the 50 times 50 on both sides, and you're gonna get 70.7 ohms. And that would be here, these impedances. 
Now, if you look at this, this is narrow, of course. Okay, so if you can come in in here and say increase this to fourth order, you get wide bandwidth, but look at the lines. They're going to start getting um, narrower and narrower. And if you go to eight, of course, as you can see here, uh, the, the lines are very, very tiny. So now you can imagine that this is only an order of eight. If you try to um, give more, you're going to get more losses and it becomes very difficult to fabricate and so on. So that's the other reason why we would want to do that this way. So, okay, so today we're gonna pick one illustration, one more illustration on uh, on these um, radial uh, combiners and splitters. And um, today we picked one uh, last time we picked a cavity uh, with a cavity with a um, tapered coaxial, uh, oversized coaxial line, and we showed how you design that with uh, use it with uh, multi uh, probes, micro strip probes as peripheral ports, and uh, it was unfortunate I uh, I mistakenly mentioned that it was a eight-way combiner, I designed eight-way and 10-way. And unfortunately, I loaded the 10-way and kept talking about the eight-ways. But everything other than that is valid, regardless, OK? Because uh, all it is, you increase the radius to accommodate more probes around. So today, we're going to talk about um, so, uh, a new, uh, another design, which is uh, <clears throat> to actually, this design uses um, coaxial peripheral um, uh, probes that ha that are uh, basically the um, the uh, inner conductor is used as extended to be used as a uh, a quarter a wavelength uh, probe and it's uh, the tip of the uh, the probe is loaded with a disc and uh, the that that is basically well known for a waveguide to coaxial line transitions where. They use disks to a uh, capacitive disk to uh, basically uh, shorten the uh, the length of the uh, probe and to get better impedance and more better bandwidth. It's well you can look that up. It's it's a um, a common method. Okay, so today we're going to talk about a sixteen way power combiner or divider based on the coaxial ring cavity with SMA type connector outputs terminated with disk for capacitive loading. And uh, let's just take a look at that. Um, I have the uh, design loaded here. And basically uh, what we have, we have um, a, um, we have um, this tapered line here that feeds the signal here. Basically usually there's a connector in here. I, uh, this time around I didn't draw, I draw a full coaxial section sticking out of this. I just basically excited a wave with a with a piece of metal inner connector that that that, that corresponds to <coughs> the dimensions of a um, of a, of a, of a coaxial line, fifty ohm coaxial line, and then you start out, and there is a uh, the signal starts out, and this is a cavity basically where we have a coaxial cavity where we have the um, the uh, th this cylinder in here is basically hollow from inside, as you can see here. This line here is hollow, and it it, it is actually um, um, isolated with a with a gap from the uh, from the inner, okay. And the tapering is done on both the outer and the inner. So um, let's just uh, show here the. Uh, the pieces, as you can see, let's see, this is the, uh, okay. okay. All right, let me, uh, okay, so this is the cone, okay. The cone comes in, that's the inner um, conductor of the coaxial 
line that is tapered starts out here and it tapers all the way to um, um, to the bottom, okay? And at the bottom where this here comes in, there's another piece, uh, I'm sure that, there's another disc here that, that falls in, uh, let's just, okay. So here it is. This is this is basically the inner conductor, okay. And and we come down here to the bottom, and there's a disc that you can see here. The disc is around here. This disc is extended, okay. This is an air gap, and this disc cavity in here has a, a sixteen probes, coaxial probes that are. Uh, that are coming in, as you can see here, let me see if we can show these in a better way. Uh, we have the inner, you can see the inner sticking out here and there is a cab in here. So let's go ahead and um, show these caps and these, okay. These here is the, the these are the probes, the peripheral uh, co uh, connectors. Basically there's a hole in the bottom and this hole lets you insert the coaxial line. And uh, this is the, the, the okay, if, if you can see here, these are, these are distributed equally, symmetrically around the, um, the, the disc. And the disc has a distance, this distance here from the wall to the center of the disc, which is the tip of the probe, is a quarter wavelength, so this acts as a short. This here is as if this is similar to the stuff that I've designed in the uh, waveguide transitions, where we get a probe and then the distance from the wall that is shorted here is a quarter wavelength. Okay, and the uh, there's a benefit to this using the ring like this is because let's look at the uh, from the bottom view. As you can see here, they are distributed inside. These are uh, this is from the bottom looking up, and this is the base of the oversized coaxial inner conductor. Okay. The the good thing about this is that anytime you increase the number of pores, let's say you want to go to thirty two or tw uh, uh, instead of sixteen, then you would increase the um, the radius or the diameter of both the um, oversized um, Tabor and the uh, um, the outside of the ring, but the width, the width which is this here, is still maintained same distance, and this is good because now, if you have any um, higher order modes, as you know from increasing the diameter of the cavity. Uh, higher order modes do not apply in this case because you have kept the um, the width of the uh, ring resonator the same regardless of the number of outputs in here, and that's good because unlike the other stuff that we just we showed last time, uh, there's few of them, three of them. Every one of those uh, was dependent on a cavity, and the cavity as you to get more outputs out of it, you need to increase the diameter, and therefore you very soon it's a, it's, a, it's a, of course it's a it's a circular waveguide. So very soon as you uh, increase the diameter, you get it to uh, you go past you go nearer near and near. You start approaching the next cutoff frequency for the next adjacent mode, and that becomes dispersive, and you get a lot of losses on that. Okay, so um, the uh, signal uh, is fed on the top. As you can see in here, the signal is fed like a coaxial disc, okay? And it's fed equally 360 degrees apart. And that, of course, serves to distribute the, uh, the field equally. Let's look at this from top, okay. Okay. Okay, if you look in here, that that basically uh, distributes the signal equally to the to the tapered line, which um, uh, distributes the signal equally to all of these 
uh, ports, okay? And uh, just to show you the, uh, let's look at the electromagnetic field in here. This is the, um, the electromagnetic signal, of course, it's fed in here, as you can see, that's the hottest point. And the way it does, it, it propagates down um, in, the, um, in the gap, in the cavity between, the, which is the, the area between the, uh, the air filled area between the inner conductor and the shield, which we'll call this cylinder in here that is hollow. It has a cone, hollow cone inside, okay? And it goes all the way down to the um, to the probes and gets picked up by the probes. And just to show you that, this is the probes. You can see the signal leaks into the ring cavity and gets picked up uh, by the by these probes equally. So you get mashed um, amplitude, phase, and delay, and uh, so there are no mismatches like you would get in. Um, you know, corporate uh, work of some type. So let's let's animate this and and just view how this is done. Okay, so let's look at it uh, vertically. So as you can see, the signal gets fed here and equally gets propagates down to the probes. Okay. Let's look at it from the bottom. Okay, so you can see how the signal symmetrically gets radiated and in the disk in here, it goes to these probes. And of course, at the probes, now the distance between the edge of the cavity inside that air-filled cavity, the center of the probe is a quarter wavelength at this operating wavelength, so you don't get any signal to leak toward the um, the walls of the cavity, okay? So this right now is doing splitting. If you want to do combining, that can be very easily done. Let's go, uh, before we get to that, let's, let's get, um, let's clarify, just show you how the, uh, just the, uh, this is, this is the same design. All I did is I split it in half trying to visually show you how the, the the probe mechanism is done. As you can see here, you can see here that here's the uh, the edge of, the, this is the disc, okay? And the disc here is, uh, this is air gap filled all the way, that's between the the outer, which is this shield, the, what we call shield in here, the outer and the inner, this is the inner. And this is where you feed it up on top using a coaxial connector, okay? But you can see here, this is a half of the probes, and it's basically, it's a coaxial line with Teflon around it, and the outer shield comes in and touches the bottom so that you get grounded, uh, ground reference to the whole assembly. And then the, uh, basically, as you can see in here, this is a cross section, the opening of the um, cavi ring cavity, Okay, so the signal comes in here and starts, propagates down, comes in here and starts to build up toward getting uh, transferred onto a TEM mode for a transmission line. This exactly in here, this piece in here is exactly the same. You would design it the same way you would design a, uh, a, um, a waveguide, uh, a rectangular waveguide to, um, coaxial line transition, okay? So let's get back and show a little bit more details on, on this stuff. So, uh... <clears throat> so we said last time that where would you use these devices? These devices, of course, can be used in this case, like these ones in here, where you have a power amplifier, uh, a radial, uh, assembly of power amplifiers, and you can split the signal and distribute to all of them. Of course, in this one in here, somebody might look at this and say, this, this is not a cone, like unlike the other one that I just showed you. Well, this transformer in here is probably a, a, a Klopstein uh, transformer or exponential transformer. The other one that I just showed you is linear transform, transformer. So what it does in here 
you go from 50, which is the ratio of the inner to the, uh, to the, uh, the outer to the inner in here, all the way to this point here in, uh, in, in a linear fashion, okay? But nevertheless, this is exactly the same. So the, bear with me, this, uh, this is not PowerPoint, so I'm using this and it keeps going back to the initial point. So anyway, you you have you have a splitting in the, in the first one. Now, of course, how do you determine the width of this area in here, the, the gap between the, the air gap between the outer to the inner, okay? How do you determine that? You determine that based on the matching, okay, that you need to match to. Uh, and also so you make it mechanically so that you can fit inside here in this hollow area, all these um, amplifiers in here. And uh, these are, it's beyond this, the scope of this presentation to talk about how this is done in here. But uh, basically these are amplifiers that have input um, probes and output probes that pick up the signal um, in free space, basically, in here. It's, they're not physically uh, connected. Okay, so our design, like you said, I showed you, uh, basically is 16 uh, probes, coaxial probes that are done in the disk in here. And there's a cone, the, a tapered coaxial line, and it's fed at the top where it distributes the signal to this. And this is a, so the taper line uh, from n-type connector or a semiconductor, either way, to the power divider input for providing space and smooth change of the impedance, because you really want to transform. This is a this is a, a a transformer actually, an impedance transformer, and there are ways to design this. You can look them up and tapered uh, uh, impedance transformers. And we transform the impedance from 50 all the way to the parallel combination of 16 um, probes in this case, okay? So we showed you this, that's the cross section of one of the probes. Uh, basically, as you can see here, it's disk loaded and it's capacitive, okay? So, and there are reasons to this. You can look up the, the theory of behind the uh, waveguide uh, disk loaded um, coaxial uh, uh, waveguide to coaxial line um, transitions, and it will show you how to do this. Basically, simply said, it's basically just a capacitor that reduces the need to have this as a quarter wavelength inside. Okay. All right. So, again, uh, what are the parts? Of this, uh, we have the the central part, which is a standard coaxial line in here that feeds the signal to the oversized uh, waveguide, um, coaxial waveguide, which is this one here. And it's a waveguide because there is an air gap. Between, there is no Teflon in here where there is up on top for the little piece of connector. But in here, it's an air cavity, air, air between the shield and the inner conductor. And the uh, they both taper down to um, a value that matches the impedance that is loading it. Okay, uh, and uh, so uh, there's a taper coaxial line. There's a waveguide ring which is in the bottom in here, and there's a disc loaded SMA type connector probes that are here. So that's very much. Now. Uh, I know I mentioned this, but one of the good things about having a disc at the bottom of the uh, of the um, oversized coaxial uh, assembly, unlike the from the previous video, you can check that one where we didn't have um, a disc like this. We just basically inserted the probes into the cavity and and probe uh, coupled the signal out of the uh, inner conductor of the oversized uh, coaxial cable. In that case, of course, every time you need to increase the number of peripheral outputs, you have to extend the waveguide radius more and more, and very much you start getting into um, exciting higher order modes, and that will just uh, 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 disrupt the signal and, and uh, introduce dispersion and losses. 
unlike that, of course, scenario, if we have a disk, like in this case, this one here, this disk here, that is basically comes in, extends the, the air uh, cavity between the inner and outer shield of the, uh, of the cone, it just extends it further so that you can build a, a hollow disk. Um, the reason for that is now, if you need like, for instance, this is 16 way combiner or splitter, and this is 32 where you're doubling this, you can see that we increase the diameters, but the ring cavity width here, this width is still the same, okay? And that's really good because that way we don't, um, for this particular design, this is between uh, basically um, uh, the frequency is between, I would say three and a half gigahertz to 12 gigahertz, okay? And uh, I yet to investigate why is this happening in here, it should be smooth, but this is at lower frequencies. Uh, so I'm gonna look into that further. But one of the areas that may cause this is the, 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 um, the probe, this area here. Okay, so you need you really need to optimize the the look the the dimensions of the disk, the uh, length of this piece here that feeds from the disk to the edge of the uh, the uh, the uh, the ring cavity, and then also the spacing from the ceiling of the cavity because that's capacitive. So, all right. So uh, now we did show this visually how this is done. So let's read this to go up before we do that. Let's read up. So down. Okay. Now coaxial ring cavity 16 way power combiner divider. First of all, like it says here, input signal is fed to SMA or N type connector at the top and then divided into 16 equal output signals, uh, that, that's because you just, it's really infinite number, but it propagates down the, the cavity, the coaxial cavity, is fit uh, and it fit in parallel to the over, uh, oversized coaxial waveguide, okay? A coaxial taper feed port provides axial symmetry, electromagnetic field excitation for the ring cavity, which is down here, okay? Power divider and maintains good output port amplitude and phase balance, okay? It also provides good impedance matching to the input port to the, uh, well, you know, one of those days I'm gonna make a video on uh, this this theory of table line transformer matching, but it's pretty simple. You can take a look at it and, and Klobstein transformer is one case, but you can also use linear, like in this case here, that's a linear transformation. And they have some exponential transformation, but these are good broadband transformers. Um, but they're, um, they're uh, the only thing about them, they're long physically. And you can see that here relative to the, the, the other dimensions, this is long vertically, sticks out. Okay, and, and that's, that's why, that's one of the reasons, let me go back to uh, this slide here. As you can see here, Actually, this I haven't got, gone to it yet, but let's let's look at that device back. Oh, we don't have it. Okay. Well, let me skip ahead just to show you. I'm just going to make a hole. As you can see, look at at this. I mean, this is a a huge power amplifier, um, and uh, you can see the power amplifiers are here. And this is one of these conic um, uh, power dividers. You can see how the length of this, there's two of them, extends out mechanically. So it's a sizable uh, device. It's, 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 it's large, it's not small. And that's because we need to, the reasons, one of the reasons why it's so long like this is because You've got very low impedance due to the parallel combination of the peripheral ports loading the the um, tapered uh, transformer, and you need to get from fifty to a few ohms, and in, in that order you can see that you can get pretty uh, long to accommodate that uh, to get a bandwidth also accommodated. 
All right, so it also provides good impedance match. Okay, now to provide proper impedance matching, of course, that's talking about the matching between the the cone and the uh, peripheral ports, the probes. Uh, the length of each coaxial probe should be lambda g over four. That's the wave where lambda g is the waveguide wavelength at the center frequency, of course. However, the length of the coaxial probe is less than lambda g over four because it's capacitively loaded. Of course, we know that even from the video I had on the compline filters where the resonators are loaded with capacitive caps like this, um, you can go back and same, same phenomenon. Okay, the stipped inner conductor further improves the wide band impedance match. Okay, that's obviously, you know, Okay, the mechanism of how the coupling or the transition from the conic or the um, the tapered um, uh, coaxial waveguide to the um, um, to the cavity, the ring cavity, and then on toward the the, uh, the uh, probe is shown in here, and you can see that. The, the E field comes like this and starts gradually building up so that it gets picked up by the probe in here. And we just showed that, so. Now, there are a few publications on these. And uh, so a lot of people try to, uh, you know, uh, look at different aspects of this. So there's, uh, good number of, of publications on these radar combiners and splitters. But one of the things they all have in common is when they model this and look at this, of course, from the, this is the feed point when you're splitting. Okay, and this is this is the inner um, conductor of the coaxial line, and this is the outer. Okay, the outer is basically also, uh, is used as the uh, cover assembly for the whole thing. Uh, now, one thing you know that you can start out all these dimensions and all of these has to be optimized on the EM simulator. But the the model for this is really as this. We've got a transmission line in here, that piece. And then we've got the uh, coaxial table, which is this here, L2. Okay. And then we've got another little piece of line, which is this here. Okay. And then we have a uh, an n number in this case 16 uh, paths of 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 loads on this point here that's this point here okay and if you look at this you start out from the, this is the output of the sma probe and then when you look forward in you can see all these pieces that that accounts for all the things that are there for instance you can see that when you go in here there's a little transmission line and then you get a power combination of uh, three different loadings. Okay, one of them is capacitive, okay? And one of them, another one is capacitive, another one, they're all capacitive because you obviously don't have a physical connection between this and this. So you can look at this and optimize it even using circuit level simulations, if you like. Uh, the, um, the probe, uh, dimension in the uh, the ring uh, cavity is basically as this. We have, first of all, we have this dimension in here, the length of the probe, okay? The length of the probe, the height of the, uh, and, and the radius of the cab. And then we have the distance from the center of the probe to the short wall of the disc resonator. We have the height of the disc resonator and then we have a distance from the center to the edge of where the uh, outer shield of the uh, coaxial cable. So it's, it's this in this case, it's really modeled as 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 if it is a a, a waveguide, rectangular waveguide. So with the signal comes in here, and then goes out here and goes out here. So all of these plays. And here's a, a circuit model that shows all the effects that are represented by the loading on these, so. Okay, so again, how do you utilize this device? Well, this device, in this case, uh, you would utilize it if it's if it was feeding antennas, you would feed the antennas directly using SMA, 
or you can have an array of power amplifiers in this case. So you have one device here to split the signal 16 way. And then you have 16 ways of um, combining on the other end and you get the high power uh, connection over here on this side, okay? And this is, of course, I showed this earlier. This is an example. Uh, okay, so another example of, of fabrication is done here. As you can see, here's the cone, here's the probes. This is looking inside, and, and this is the cavity, okay, the outer shield of the coaxial. So the, this piece here, this cone, and this is basically the coaxial line. Now the disc is down here, if there is one. Okay, sometimes they, they don't use one. They just directly couple out of the signal on there. But if there is, this is, in this case, there is a, a disc cavity in here, okay? And then, of course, when you close the lid on it, it looks something like this. Okay, my friends, so um, I hope you enjoyed this. Um, now, if you need uh, any of the, uh, of the HFSS models that you see on here, I welcome you to uh, email me. Um, it's for a, a small piece of donation. I usually do a donation uh, for the uh, source file on these designs. So if you need to get any of these designs, but if you come to my training class, of course, you get free copies of all of these designs. And in addition to um, really building them yourself, we sit down and in groups, we will build these, everybody will build one of these things for that session. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. I look forward. We've got one more where we have the same thing, except we, we're going to put microstrip probes and replace these with microstrip. And that's the next week's session. And we'll show that it's very much exactly the same. Why do we put microstrip instead of coaxial? Well, it's the question of why wouldn't you? Because uh, obviously when you connect this, this is a small, this is a, a small section of another system. So basically you wanna integrate this in a planar uh, output. The peripheral ports has to be planar so that you can go in and amplify the signal or uh, whatever is needed to do next. Uh, this would be a case where, for instance, this is used uh, in a, some kind of uh, astronomy or some kind of uh, uh, just a passive way, uh, combiner or splitter, or to feed antennas that have um, SMA or N uh, type. Now we use SMA on this end because SMA is small radius assembly compared to the end type. On top, we use end type, okay? But in here, we don't really use uh, SMAs. The other thing why would we do that is because also, as you know, it can handle high power in here. So if this is combining, it's easier for SMA to combine medium power levels where the end type in here will interface to the higher power. Okay, this is Mohammed Nizami again, thanking you uh, again. I, I appreciate you uh, um, listening to this. And um, again, um, if don't forget to um, look at coming into my um, training course, which will be hands on, and you it's of a great benefit for. Uh, practicing engineers for aerospace, microwave um, systems, and for graduate students as well. And it's very reasonably uh, priced in here compared to the prices that are in the United States. Okay, my friends. So until next week, I'll see you. Cheers. And Happy New Year for you all. Oh.